Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 12, Remastered. This is the final episode in this series on The Cell. In the last few episodes, we've explored quite a bit into the cell and cellular functions. I've discussed the role of proteins and enzymes in cellular functions, how cells talk to one another, the lipid bilayer membrane, the endomembrane vascular system, the organelles, and a little bit about the basic metabolic and respiratory pathways. Well, in this episode, I'm going to discuss the four stages of the cell's life, that is, the cell cycle, the stages that a cell naturally goes through before it replicates itself and creates two new daughter cells. Recall the cell theory that I mentioned in some of the earlier episodes, especially episode one. One of the original tenets of the cell theory was that cells arise from pre-existing cells. Now this raises an obvious question. How does a cell arise from another cell? Or conversely, how does a cell divide to give rise to daughter cells? This process, as you might have surmised, is called cellular division. To really get to the answer of our questions, we have to look at how cell division works on a molecular level. Now there's two types of cell division with two very similar but fundamentally different chemical processes. The first type is called mitosis. During mitosis, a cell will copy its organelles and chromosomes and split them evenly between the two emergent daughter cells. Because each daughter cell shares a copy of the parent cell's genome, the daughter cells are clones of the parent cell. As the parent cell is itself a clone of its parent cell, you kind of quickly realize that all the cells of a single organism's body are clones of the same genome. The single individual organism has a body that's composed entirely of these cloned cells, which grew and replicated from an original embryo that had that original founding genome. Now, if you're talking about an asexual species, the offspring is a clone of the parent. And so you just have this clonal lineage of cells going on and on and on through the generations. But in sexual species, the offspring is not a clone of the parent. There's genetic variation between the offspring and the parent. But where does this genetic variation come from? The answer brings us to the second type of cell division, which is called meiosis. During meiosis, a cell doesn't copy its chromosomes, but it continues to split them up evenly between its two daughter cells, which are then called gametes. In this way, each daughter cell only has a haploid copy of the parent's genome, where the parent cell had a diploid copy. It had two copies of the genome. Humans, and many other sexually reproducing species, are diploids, and this means that each of our cells has two copies of our chromosomes. Triploid cells possess three copies of their chromosomes. Haploid cells only possess one copy of the chromosomes. When our diploid parent cell undergoes meiosis, it produces two haploid gametes. These haploid gametes each have a single copy of the full chromosome. Because the vast bulk of cells in our body are somatic cells, or body cells, they only perform mitosis, and they only produce clone daughter cells. Tissue differentiation begins with stem cells, although the stem cells are a whole different episode in and of themselves. So to be very brief, stem cells basically code their daughter cells to express specific genes. This specific gene expression causes the cell to differentiate itself into the various tissues of your body. Your nerve cells, your skin cells, and your eye cells, for example, contain the exact same genetic material, the exact same genome. These cells are clones of each other genetically. However, due to the epigenetic pattern that each of these cell lineages carries, these cells will each express a different collection of the genes within this shared genome. And this selective expression of the genes causes them to develop into different shapes and perform different functions. A retinal cell in your eye is very differently shaped and has a very different function than the neural cell in your brain. And the same goes again with the osteocytes in your bones and the epithelial cells lining your blood vessels. Okay, so let's get back to the cell cycle. 
There's four stages to this cycle. There's the first gap stage called G1. There's the S stage. There's the second gap stage called G2. And then there's M stage. M stands for mitosis or meiosis, whichever one it is. Each one takes place in the same relative position in the cell cycle. Now the G1, the S, and the G2 stages are all a part of interphase, which is the stage of any cell not currently dividing, or not in M stage. In interphase, the cell basically acts normally. It's living its life. It performs whichever specialized function its gene expression dictates, whichever function was encoded into it by its stem cell ancestors. Both the G1 and the G2 stages are characterized by this mundane normalcy. They call them gap stages because the cell is just doing its thing. It's respiring oxygen and carbon dioxide, it's communicating with proximal cells, it's doing general upkeep and maintenance on its internal structures, it's repairing and cleaning up its DNA, all of this kind of stuff. But at the end of G1, there's a checkpoint. This checkpoint is like a self-check test in single-celled organisms, and a community evaluation of sorts in multicellular organisms. If the cell passes this checkpoint, it continues on with the cell cycle to enter S phase. If the cell fails this checkpoint, it enters a dormant stage called G0, which I'll discuss more in a few minutes. The G1 checkpoint is like a full-body diagnostic. The quality and the health of the cell as a whole is taken into consideration. The cell has to have undamaged DNA. The cell has to be the proper size to be able to produce a viable daughter cell. The cell has to be in some kind of environment that isn't nutrient-stressed. The cell must be able to recognize and respond to chemical signals from other cells, called social signals. If the cell can't do one or more of these things, if any of these measures aren't up to par, then there's some mechanisms within the cell that will act to immediately halt its progress in the cell cycle. If the DNA is damaged, for example, a protein called P53 activates specific genes in an emergency response. These activated genes will either halt the cell cycle until the damage can be fixed, or they'll cause it to abandon ship. This latter option is like totaling your car. It's a total loss. It's pretty much impossible to fix or replace without risk or egregious expense. If the DNA is sufficiently damaged, then the P53 protein can trigger apoptosis, and this leads to the voluntary death of the cell. Now the G2 phase has a similar checkpoint but it focuses purely on the integrity of the genome. If the cell's DNA is damaged or degraded in any significant way, then the cell will simply not be allowed to enter M phase. This is important because when you're talking about M phase where the cell is replicating itself, if it has any genetic problems, if there's any errors or miscoded genes, then when you replicate it and produce new daughter cells, these errors will be passed on, and you don't want that. The, the organism doesn't want that. And so if there's any problems at all with the DNA here at the end of G2 stage, the cell will not go into M phase. It's a self-protective regulatory mechanism. Okay, now recall the G0 phase that I mentioned a moment ago. The G0 stage is basically just an arrested G1 phase. The cell is no longer in the cell cycle. It doesn't bother with checkpoints anymore, it doesn't synthesize a copy of its DNA, and it doesn't replicate. The G0 phase can be described as post-mitotic, as it no longer experiences mitosis. Many adult cells will actually naturally enter a non-reproducing G0 stage once they mature. Some examples of these cells include nerve cells in your brain, which are almost never reproduced, but can last for life. And then you also have muscle cells, which are too long and too protein-packed to undergo normal replication. The checkpoint at the end of the G1 stage is heavily dependent on the social signals that the cell receives from nearby cells. This communal signaling ensures that all of the cells in a tissue or local community are going through the cell cycle in a kind of rough synchronization. The synchronization isn't perfect, but it instead induces a kind of cyclical pattern of growth and division in the cell community. 
First, various proteins and chemicals that enable proper growth are released by all the cells, or at least by the cells in a similar stage in the cell cycle. These growth factors begin working by initiating the production of other regulatory proteins, namely E2F and G1 cyclins. Let me define a cyclin real quick. A cyclin is a compound whose concentration cycles between high and low within the cell. As the cell undergoes some kind of behavior, the concentration of a cyclin will rise. As the behavior changes, or comes to an end, or is otherwise modified, typically in response to the rise of this cyclin concentration, then the concentration of cyclin will begin to decrease. As I explained in the previous episode with a calmodulin example, the concentration of a specific chemical can be the trigger that induces a response. The cyclin binds to a kinase, which is a type of protein that can catalyze the phosphorylation of another protein. These kinases are only active when it's bound to a cyclin so its activity is dependent on the concentration of cyclin in the solution. As a reasonable course of events, this kinase is called CDK, or a cyclin-dependent kinase. During the G1 checkpoint, the concentration of both cyclin and CDK increases as the growth factors continue to induce the production of cyclins. The other protein produced by the growth factor, E2F, is bound to and inactivated by a tumor suppressor protein called RB. The cyclin CDK complex is also inactivated during this time. Eventually, the CDK cyclin complex is dephosphorylated, which then activates it. This activated CDK cyclin complex then catalyzes the phosphorylation of RB. The addition of this large, negatively charged phosphate group induces a major conformational change in the RB protein. This conformational change makes RB unable to hold on to E2F any longer, which means that the E2F gets released. The released E2F is no longer inhibited, which allows it to activate specific genes and induce the cell to enter S phase. When the cell enters S phase, it's still an interphase. It's still doing all the things it normally does, but with one exception. The S in S phase stands for synthesis as the cell begins to synthesize DNA. It's not that the cell is making DNA from scratch, it's copying its own DNA and using that to make more. In a human, each copy of the chromosome will take a condensed form, and this will create 23 chromatids, or protein-dotted clumps of tightly wrapped up DNA. The original chromatid and the copy chromatid are called sister chromatids. To copy the entire genome is a massive undertaking for the cell. It requires an absolutely titanic amount of nucleotides, not to mention ribose sugar and phosphate groups for the backbone. Creating copies of all of the organelles requires a similarly titanic amount of phospholipids and the associated membrane proteins. All of these resources take considerable energy to organize and put together which means that S phase is characterized by increased metabolic activity to accommodate the synthesis of a whole new copy of the genome and a whole new copy of all of the cell's internal structures. Now, if the cell passes all of these interface checkpoints, if it goes through S phase and duplicates its genome and its organelles, and it goes through G2 phase again, it'll eventually enter M phase, and it'll begin mitosis or meiosis. Here, each sister chromatid pair is split up, and each independent daughter chromatid in the pair goes to one or the other daughter cells. Each daughter cell will thus have one copy of the same genome, emerging from M stage to find itself right back in G1 phase, at the very start of the cell cycle. Now this might sound pretty straightforward, but M phase is anything but simple. It's incredibly complicated, and it's an extremely delicate, fragile process that has to be done perfectly. Otherwise, there's a lot of downstream health effects that might disable or kill the daughter cells. There's five stages within M phase, corresponding to the steps of mitotic cell division. I'll discuss meiosis and its stages in much more detail in a future episode, most likely in the next series on genetics. So anyway, these five stages of mitosis are, in chronological order, prophase, prometaphase, 
metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Prophase is the beginning of emphase, and it's marked by two major events. The first event involves the genetic material of the cell. The strings of DNA will condense into compact protein-studded chromosomes. As the DNA was replicated in the S phase, the DNA in the M phase will condense into the chromosomes. The second event involves the beginning of the formation of the spindle apparatus. Now this involves two structures called centrosomes, which each have two identical subunits called centrioles. Each centriole looks like nine short tubes, positioned with their long sides together, you know, running parallel, to form a larger tube. Now from the centrioles, microtubules are generated, and they extend outwards into the cell to organize and structure the subsequent steps of cellular division. Because each centrosome goes to one end of the cell, their microtubule fingers will reach across the cell, from the ends towards the middle. Some of these microtubules will keep extending as they meet in the middle, and they'll overlap past each other. These particularly long microtubules are called polar microtubules, because they're kind of reaching from one pole to the other. Once the chromosomes have condensed and the spindle apparatus is formed, the cell will enter the next stage of M phase, called prometaphase. In prometaphase, the nuclear envelope, or the double layers of the phospholipid bilayer, will dissolve and disappear. This exposes the condensed chromosomes to the rest of the cell, which is critically important for the next step of prometaphase. The microtubules that were set up in prophase now extend through the cell, and they connect to structures at the center of each chromosome called a kinetochore. If you imagine the traditional X-shaped chromosome, the kinetochore is the globular structure at the middle of that X, that helps hold everything together. So some of the microtubules will bind to these kinetochores, and this will then enable the next stage of M phase. So after prometaphase, we have metaphase. And in metaphase, the microtubules will align the chromosomes into a flat plane running down the center of the cell. This mass of chromosome pairs organized into the plane at the center of the cell is called the metaphase plate. It's like a plate of DNA and proteins. The formation of the metaphase plate marks the final step in the formation of the spindle apparatus. The polar microtubules that are overlapping in the middle of the cell now reach and connect to the opposite centrosome. Because of the very dynamic nature of the structure of microtubules, they decay at one end and grow at, at another. So for example, if you're looking at the microtubules that connect the centrosomes to the chromosomes, the end that is on the centrosome is called the negative end. The end that's attached to the kinetochore on the, on the chromosomes is called the positive end. The negative end of the microtubules is virtually anchored to the centrosomes. But the positive end, which is connected to the kinetochore on the chromosomes, that end is actively being disassembled. As the positive end frays apart, the length of the microtubule shrinks, and whatever's hanging off the end of it is brought closer and closer to the centrosomes. Now this quality is really important for understanding the next stage of M phase. This next stage is called anaphase, and it begins when the bond between the sister chromatids is broken, and each daughter chromatid is then pulled by the centrosomes to either end of the dividing cell and this is segregating each individual copy of the chromosome in preparation for division. The daughter chromatids are pulled to the centrosomes by two different mechanisms. The first mechanism involves kinetochore proteins, which form a collar around the positive end of the microtubule. As the positive end of the microtubule frays outwards, spilling subunits out into the solution, it tends to widen. This widening pushes against the inside of the collar, and it pushes it further down the microtubule that hasn't begun to fray and decay apart yet. In this way, the kinetochore hangs on to the dissolving end of the microtubule, and it gets carried along with it as the microtubule dissolves. This event is also an integral part of the first M phase checkpoint, which makes sure that the sister chromatids separate properly. If the microtubules don't connect to the kinetochores, 
the daughter cells will have an inappropriate number of chromosomes, which can lead to serious developmental problems if not outright death. The second mechanism involves the centrosomes themselves, which are pushed by polar microtubules further into the opposite corners of the cell. These two mechanisms force the sister chromatids apart, with one copy going to each corner of the cell. Anaphase comes to an end when one copy of each chromatid is dragged to a centrosome. This basically means that anaphase comes to an end when there's two clumps of cloned chromatids clustered in each corner of the cell. Once all of the DNA in the cell has been copied, and each copy of the genome is pulled into opposite ends of the cell, the cell can undergo the last stage of M phase, called telophase. Recall that in prometaphase, the nuclear envelope dissolved, disappeared. Well, during telophase, this nuclear envelope reforms around each clump of cloned chromatids, forming two new nucleuses. Within these reformed nuclear envelopes, the condensed DNA in all of the chromatids begins to loosen and unravel. By loosening and unraveling, the DNA makes itself far more accessible to the protein machinery that reads, translates, and transcribes the information in DNA into proteins. Outside of the nuclear envelope, the structural fibrils on the inner surface of the cell membrane will begin to pinch off the middle. These structural fibers are actin filaments, and they form a ring around the middle of the membrane, kind of like a belt or an outline of the metaphase plate on the inside of the plasma membrane. Myosin protein fibers attach to this actin, and they begin to pull themselves along to tighten the actin belt. This is the same mechanism through which muscle fiber works, but muscle fiber is a whole different discussion. That's a different episode, too. Anyways, as the actin fibers are connected to the inner surface of the plasma membrane, the tightening will pull the membrane along with it, creating a deep crevice called a cleavage furrow. The cleavage furrow will deepen as the actin belt is tightened. The actin belt will eventually close off entirely, causing the cell's cytoplasm to split into two separate bubbles, each of them containing a nuclear envelope with a full copy of the genome and a full complement of the copied organelles. The cytoplasm is pinched off, the membrane separates, and two new daughter cells are born, each one possessing the exact same genetic information as their parent cell. This act of pinching off the cytoplasm and the separation of the membrane into two smaller daughter cells is called cytokinesis. There's a substance called M phase promoting factor, or MPF, which induces a cell in interphase to enter M phase. To understand how MPF works, we have to understand the chemical structure of MPF and how it interacts with other molecules. The physical structure of MPF is defined by two subunits, belonging to chemical groups called cyclins and kinases. Together, these two subunits make an MPF molecule, or an MPF complex. Cyclins, as I said, are molecules whose concentration in a cell cycles from high to low over a certain period of time. As in the case of calmodulin, higher concentrations cause the blood vessels to expand. In the case of MPF cyclin, the concentration rises during interphase to peak in M phase, where the concentration then crashes back to zero which ends M phase. The concentration of cyclins will then increase again during interphase, only to peak again and crash during the next M phase. Now, besides the cyclin, the other subunit here was the kinase, which is an enzyme that can catalyze the phosphorylation of another protein. I swear I've said that like five times in the last two episodes. Anyway, as the concentration of cyclin increases during interphase, it'll bind with the CDK. Two phosphorylation reactions are used as regulatory tags to keep the CDK cyclin complex inactive until enough of it has been produced to effectively initiate M phase. Now at the end of the G2 phase, and immediately before M phase, an enzyme is produced that dephosphorylates the MPF complex, which activates it and allows the kinase subunit to catalyze phosphorylation reactions.
So after M phase has been initiated, this concentration of MPF crashes. What happens to the CDK cyclin complex to cause its rapid destruction? Well, the MPF is regulated by negative feedback. As MPF is necessary to enter M phase, it follows that M phase cannot happen without high concentrations of MPF. Now within M phase, an enzyme is activated. This activated enzyme begins to deactivate all of the MPF that it can find. Another regulatory process works through targeted destruction. During anaphase, the second to last step in M phase, an enzyme complex is activated which begins to hunt down and tag the MPF cyclin. This enzyme complex tags the molecules of MPF cyclin with small proteins called ubiquitins. This ubiquitin tag marks the protein for destruction at the hands of another complex called the proteasome. Through these two mechanisms, the concentration of MPF is self-regulating. The concentration is raised gradually through interphase, and then at the end of G2 phase, when it's in high concentrations, it's activated, and this initiates M phase. Various proteins are then activated throughout M phase, which then work to deactivate and break down the subunit proteins in MPF. This negative feedback drastically reduces the concentration of MPF. It ends another revolution in the cell cycle, and it puts the cell back at the start of interphase. The completion of cytokinesis indicates successful passage through the second M phase checkpoint. If the chromosomes don't separate properly, the proteins that degrade cyclin molecules aren't activated. If these proteins aren't activated, cyclin molecules aren't tagged with ubiquitin, they aren't degraded, and as a result, the concentration of CDK cyclin complexes, or MPF, doesn't drop. The concentration of MPF stays high. Now if the concentration of MPF is high, the process of cytokinesis is stalled. The proper handling of protein complexes are also involved in the regulation of the G1 checkpoint. If the RB protein is defective, it won't be able to bind and deactivate the E2F protein. Without regulation, the E2F protein will continually push the cell to enter S phase. Cyclins can also be overproduced by the presence of excessive growth factor, or some issue in the signaling pathway that can't shut down cyclin production even without growth factor. Problems with either RB or cyclin production can cause cells to override the G1 checkpoint and move into the S phase prematurely. It's really important to understand the healthy and proper functioning of the cell cycle, because any errors or mistakes that are made in the cell cycle can have disastrous consequences. Uncontrolled cellular replication creates masses of quickly reproducing cells called tumors, or cancers. Cancer is basically a group of cells that have, through DNA mutation or some kind of interference, lost the ability to regulate their reproduction. Cancerous cells have two specific problems that prevent them from regulating their reproduction. First, these cells can't turn off the proteins involved in growth and reproduction. They're constantly active, but for whatever reason, the cell just can't turn them off. And so it's constantly being told, you gotta grow, you gotta get ready to reproduce, keep growing, keep reproducing, and the cell just never stops. Second, cancer cells can't express genes that work to suppress cancer by shutting down the cell cycle in damaged cells. So even if the cell recognizes a problem, it can't shut down the factory. It can't stop the assembly line. The cell can't sound the alarm. It can't call in the cavalry. If you'll humor me with these metaphors, the cell has no mouth and it must scream. If a cell suffers from these two problems, it will almost certainly become cancerous. As almost all cells need to reproduce, almost all tissues are susceptible to developing cancer. Skin cancer can be one of the many different kinds of tumors that form from damaged skin cells. Rates of skin cancer are higher in areas with more sun exposure, as the UV radiation induces mutations in the cells on the outer layers of your skin.
These mutations can disable your cell's ability to regulate reproduction. And before you know it, you have a tumor. Lung cancers can be caused by exposure to airborne chemicals or particulates, like the smoke from cigarettes or the metal fumes in a welder's shop. These carcinogens aggravate and damage the delicate cells of the alveoli tissue in the lungs, and this encourages them to become cancerous. In breast cancer, tumors form from cancerous cells in mammary tissue. Cancerous cells can develop into tumors in the colon, in the bladder, the thyroid, the testicles, the pancreas. Cancer in the retina, the layer of light-detecting cells in the eye, can lead to retinoblastoma. Cancer in the blood marrow can lead to leukemia, characterized by the production of impotent, inefficient, and malformed white blood cells. Now, I could go on with all of the horrible cancers that plague life on this planet, but the point is, cancers can form almost anywhere. They can be triggered by a huge variety of environmental or genealogical factors. Now, as I discussed briefly in the beginning of the episode, there's generally two types of cancerous tumors. You got your benign tumors and your malignant tumors. Benign tumors are usually harmless. They're benign. The cancerous cells will continue to reproduce, and the tumor will continue to grow, but the tumor itself is more or less encapsulated. It won't spread, which means that the tumor exists as a single coherent mass, which can be easily removed with surgery. Now, while benign tumors are generally non-lethal, it's a mistake to say that they're totally harmless, because they're not. The benign tumor can be positioned somewhere such that its growth applies pressure onto a soft organ, like the brain. Benign tumors in the throat can impair speech, respiration, and comfortable head movement. A benign tumor that's growing in a heavily vasculated area might press against the veins and squeeze them shut and reduce blood flow to the tissue. So, while benign tumors might not necessarily be benign, they're called that because they don't spread and that's what separates them from malignant tumors. Now, malignant tumors are super shitty. They're really dangerous. They're not encapsulated in any sense, so they can spread throughout your body. Individual cells, or clumps of cells, can flake off from a malignant tumor, enter the bloodstream or a lymph vessel, and be rapidly spread throughout the body in a process called metastasis. These flakes of cancerous cells can get lodged or be deposited anywhere else in your body, where they'll likely continue to grow into new tumors. The malignant tumor spreads by basically dumping little cancer seeds into your bloodstream. These cancer seeds then lodge in your tissues, where they absorb nutrients from healthy cells and grow into new tumors. These new tumors produce little flaky cancer seeds of their own, and before you know it, the cancer has spread again. Catching a malignant tumor early is very important, as you can identify it, kill it, remove it, and contain it before it spreads. If you aren't aware of a malignant tumor for a long period of time, then by the time it gets diagnosed, it may have metastasized. It may have spread throughout your body such that there's too much cancer to remove surgically, without throwing you through a metaphorical cheese grater. The cell cycle is extremely important to all living organisms. The cell cycle and its series of carefully maintained checkpoints prevents the cell from reproducing if it has genetic damage that can be passed on to its daughter cells. The tumor suppressor genes, the checkpoints, and apoptosis are all tools that the body uses to prevent errors in the cell cycle from running amok and creating tumors. Naturally, this system isn't perfect, as people still get tumors, people still die from cancer. But it works remarkably well. If we didn't have any of these mechanisms, we'd be covered in tumors and would probably die from cancer at a very young age. But because of the cell cycle, our bodies can grow and heal in a relatively controlled context. In a future episode, I'll cover meiosis. I'll discuss how meiosis uses different mechanisms than mitosis to separate the genetic material into the haploid daughter gametes, and how this genetic material interacts during fertilization 
to create a new diploid genome of a new individual. And that's about it for this episode. I hope I was able to explain the cell cycle in a way that you can understand, and hopefully you were able to learn something cool about it. This episode wraps up this series introducing the cell, so hopefully you can feel confident in your knowledge of the basics of cellular physiology and cellular activity. And as always, thanks for listening.